Hello RJL 3000 students, Dr. Conway here for Lesson 9. Um, this week we're going to be looking at something that won't be uh, applicable to your current RIAS work because we don't have the time and um, I'm assuming that uh, there's a level of expertise that, that, that no one in the class will yet have on how to monetize benefits and costs that do not have a market price. Um, which is what the topic of Lesson 9 is about. You will recall that one of the uh, issues we learned about in RGL 2100 last term was that um, when we're regulating in areas where uh, the benefits do not have a market price, for example, when you're doing environmental protection of a river system or you're regulating for the defense of birds or trees or things like that that do not have a fixed market price, it's difficult to monetize the benefits, to have the benefits exceed the costs. And because of that, there's a tendency for downward pressure to be put on those public protection goods, which is regulation in this case, because uh, cost-benefit analysis will not easily demonstrate benefits exceeding costs. And so one of the areas that we have to think about whenever we're regulating where the uh, benefits do not have uh, a market price is how are we going to assign a market price because we know by now of course or you should that uh, most uh, RIAs of regulations that are medium or high impact regulations must complete a cost benefit analysis and one of the criticisms that environmental groups and other groups will level against this process and, and rightly so and as a matter of fact is that um, because uh, we don't have market prices, birds don't fly fly by with price tags on them, fish don't have price tags on them when they're in the river, uh, the, the, the enjoyment we get out of the natural environment, the ecotourism benefits and so on, um, these are all things that, that have to be assigned a market price in order for them to be count accounted for in a cost-benefit analysis. And as we know, uh, things that can't be counted are, in fact, not considered. And so in a lot of these processes, because the people we're speaking to who make key decisions are not necessarily experts in the field. One thing they do understand, however, is the, um, is the financial dimensions of any issue, but they do not understand the technical dimensions of all issues. And so one of the challenges of regulating in the area of the environment or in other areas where significant benefits will not have a market price is how do you provide a market surrogate price for, the, for these things. And um, while I don't expect you to do that in your, uh, in your current uh, project, I do expect that we, you, you will understand uh, what's involved when, we, when, we, when you see it in the future if you see it in the future all right so um when we so we're looking at different methods that we use for for monetizing uh uh these these benefits all right and so we're gonna just i'm just gonna provide you with a quick overview of, of some of those uh today all right so um and, and it's important to understand a couple of things. When we, when we try to provide a market price for something that does not have a market price, we are trying to create an indirect way of assigning it a market price, all right? And this is what we call surrogate indicators. So there are indirect or surrogate indicators for the value of a benefit that would otherwise not have a market price. Students often get confused between the concept of the surrogate indicator and the performance indicator. They're not the same thing, okay? Performance indicators are exactly that, right? Where you set goals for your performance of your organization or your activities, okay? And uh, for example, if it was a, a builder, he might be setting a target of increasing greed builds by 10 to 15% of total green builds on the market from our company and geographical area by 2023. That's a performance indicator that you set to, to, to direct your organization. A surrogate indicator, by contrast, reflects a research question as its primary purpose, rather than milestones towards an objective. For example, one, a, a, a surrogate indicator may have a research question is, how much value do people in this neighborhood place on this park? All right? And it's a, it's a free park. All right, so so we can't we can't look at it from the point of view of uh, how much they pay in entrance fees. Uh, we have to find some other way, some other surrogate manner to determine what value people in the neighborhood place on that park, 
or on that particular school or on that particular healthcare clinic or on other services or lighting on the streets uh, because people have security concerns or whatever the case may be. We have to find other ways to apply a value to those, okay? And, uh, and that's, that's obviously a very key issue for regulation in any areas where many of the benefits that are coming back will not be benefits that, that already have a market price assigned. They're not sold. You know, you know, the, 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 the robins and the cardinals and so on are not sold. Uh, they're, they're, they live in the wild. The, the, the bees are not, are not, are not sold, uh, well, unless you're a beekeeper. But you, you get the point that, that there are all kinds of benefits, all kinds, that provide a public good uh, to the citizenry that do not have a market price and may nevertheless and are already subject to regulation. In fact, a lot of environmental regulatory benefits fall into this category, right? And uh, and so and the, you know can also be the case that a lot of public health benefits can fall into this category. For example, like reducing the amount of smog in the environment in terms of people's enjoyment of outside space, outside physical activities, and so on. Uh, the the um, not having to close public uh, beaches because of E. coli contamination. How do you place a virus? You know the E. coli doesn't have a market price. The beach. It's a free beach. It doesn't have an entrance fee. So how are we going to assign a value to that? There are, new, there are many, many, many examples where regulation bumps up against the need to provide surrogate indicators to indicate benefits of the public goods provided by the regulation. And those are, uh, there are three broad categories that these fit into. Again, I want you to be aware of them. I don't expect you to do a lot in, uh, or any of it in your RIAs but I do expect you to identify benefits in your RIAs that you do not otherwise have currently have the financial resources, the time, or the skill yet to uh, to assign uh, apply a methodology that assigns a market value to those. Okay, but for now I just want you to mention them. But there are three categories for this type of work. The first is called the revealed preference methods. The second is stated preference methods, and finally uh, benefit transfer method which is primarily what you, you're doing in your term papers, but I'll explain that in a minute, okay? Um, revealed preference methods rely on existing market prices to reflect indirectly or surrogately the benefits and non-market attributes of a good or service, okay? The first is the hedonic price method. Uh, the, this method estimates returns for services or benefits for services that directly affect market prices. For example, you can have two completely identical houses, let's say. Two three-bedroom houses, they're essentially identical, all right? But in one neighborhood, that the price of that house is 450000 In another neighborhood, it's maybe not even all that far away, the price of that house is 525000 or 600000 whatever the case may be. What explains the difference between those two things, all right? And, and we can be asking that question by saying, what value are people in that more expensive neighborhood placing? Uh, why are they willing to pay more for that, for that house? Well, they're, they're placing an indirect or a surrogate value on the fact that maybe that neighborhood has better quality schools with higher ratings, or it has green space that the other, the other neighborhood doesn't have, or it has some shopping area or walking areas, walking trails or whatever that the, and so the difference that, that people are willing to pay between the houses creates a value indicator or a surrogate for the types of additional services and benefits that that more expensive neighbor provi neighborhood provides for essentially the exact same house and the people's willingness to spend more money for the exact same house in a neighborhood that is essentially the same distance from the city core and everything that difference must be applied to other unique characteristics or functional characteristics or hedonic characteristics that that neighborhood has. And that's the way we can place a value on the park, place a value on the walking trail, place a value on whatever, okay? And uh, that can provide a benefit. Where is that applicable? Well, you can, you can ask you can look at that in terms of any number of areas of environmental regulation where the environment has been decreased in value or has been degraded and property values go down. Where the environment is rich, 
there are old growth trees, there are wildlife, there are nice places to walk and so on. Uh, people place a value on that and we can identify those values or certainly strongly estimate them by differential prices based on function and based on benefits, okay? By looking at a, 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 you know, looking at a direct market price, which is the price of the houses, and explaining that difference by other beneficial characteristics of the respective neighborhoods, all right? And that's called the hedonic pricing method. And it, it's a very, very commonly used for everything from policing services to, to green space, to retail space, to, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it estimate, school boards use it to estimating the value that school boards bring to the city neighborhoods by the quality of their schools, right? How to invest in, how, and make arguments about investing more into schools because it increases property values in the neighborhood and that in turn increases the tax base for the municipality. The same argument can be made with police and so on. So based on those functional differences or those, those, those area differences, we can, we can place a value on those, all right, by the fact that people are willing to pay more for something that is essentially identical. So what is it that they're paying for? They're paying for these other additional hedonic benefits, okay? The, the next one under this category is called the travel cost method. And it's something that I've used quite extensively in my work in developing countries to, to explain, you know, why, uh, you know, to, to, to try to understand why people are spending more money to travel, particularly people that don't have a lot of money, that have to leave their villages. Um, and and they, would, they, they go by one, let's say, one health clinic. They say there's a health clinic near their village and there's a health clinic further away from their village. Travel's not easy. They may be traveling by, by cart. Uh, an oxen or something, right? And so yet they, they go all the way past the, the one clinic to go to the next clinic. What explains that? What is, it, what is it about that second clinic that explains their willingness to assume more travel cost uh, for, to go all the way to that clinic? And, and travel cost being not just the way we think of it in gas and wear and tear on your car, but for them it's time, it, it's potentially risk if it's of a, a risky geographical reason for violence, uh, any number of other factors need to be factored in. Why are they going all that extra? Well, it's because they're placing a value through their travel cost uh, uh, characteristics on some attributes of that second clinic, second clinic over the first clinic. And maybe let's say it's security all right let's say it's security let's say they don't like stopping at the first clinic because it's in a, a dangerous area you know and so they don't stop they just keep going and they go to the other clinic and we find out that the other clinic has a couple of unique characteristics one better security second yeah, interesting there's also shopping and everything going on around here, or there are other benefits. And now we can begin to attribute a, va a travel cost value to those additional benefits. What information does that provide us? Well, it now provides us with an understanding of how much, you know, not having those services in, in the clinic one is costing, all right? And, and if we provided those additional services in that, in that first clinic, we would be based on the, the differential in travel costs. We could invest this much because this is what the people are paying to get to that. What happens if we invested here and attracted more of those resources to clinic one? Okay, so by, you know, so again, a surrogate measure becomes the travel costs. Why are, are they, in, you know, well, because they're placing a value on the services that second clinic. Has. Now we know what the value is that they're placing on that. It's the difference between travel costs to clinic one and travel costs to clinic two. We know that people are willing to pay at least that much for those additional benefits and services. And so when we write up a strategic report or any kind of analysis, we can actually attribute the differential value between the characteristics of the two clinics. Okay? So. Um, another uh, method is very similar to travel cost is a verdict expenditures method. And it's used to measure the cost incurred by individuals to protect themselves from a known human health or safety risk. Okay? 
And this, this can be seen in a number of different, you know, police use it all the time. Bus services, transit services use it all the time. I mean, why, why are people going by this bus stop that's closer to the house but going to another bus stop? Well, because then they have a safer walk from that direction to their home or things like that. So they're placing a value, uh, right, of loss of time and, and energy on, on, on additional security services or some other benefit, okay, that attributes to that. So they're, they are occurring an expense, okay, to be able to, uh, to avoid a potential risk. Uh, so people that, you know, put security systems, large fences around their houses and all that, they're, they're all experiencing, they're all investing into an averting uh, risk expenditure that, that places a value now on, for example, why didn't we add additional police services? That we now know the value that the citizenry is placing on the additional security measures. So the city can decide to, to attribute that value to improve security services in bus stop one or whatever the case may be. Again, a security, a surrogate measure for, for what, it, what it is that the people are trying to avoid and what type of costs they're, they're incurring to try to avoid that, okay? And this, this is used in all kinds of design things for daycare services, for, uh, for shelters, for uh, all kinds of different things. And looking at, at uh, you know, how much people are, are willing to pay to avert a risk that that they that they would that they're they're avoiding that it exists in a particular site. And now we know that if if we were to regulate that site or improve that site, this is how much it's worth to the citizenry because this is what they were paying to avert that risk previously. Okay. Uh, another one in this category is the cost of illness method. Remember, I described to you the method I used for pesticide control in sub-Saharan Africa. That was a cost of illness method. All right, that looked at the the, the costs and benefits of uh, the benefits of an enhanced uh, uh, pesticide management in sub-Saharan Africa. But you know that doesn't have a price, right? I mean, we, we can't say, okay, uh, improved pesticide management, sub-Saharan Africa, price tag at the store is this. Obviously, there's no such thing. So we have to attribute some kind of a value through it through surrogate measures. So what we did was we used the cost of illness method at the impacts of, of, of pesticides on people losing work, having to go into the hospital, having to stay at the hospital. Uh, students missing school. We had to assign surrogate value because these these things all do have a market price, right? The hospital cost is a market price. The missing a day's work is a loss of salary. It does have a market price. So all of those things that did have a market price are then attributed to because they were lost because of poor pesticide management. Then the poor pesticide management value becomes the surrogate of those medical costs, those lost days at work, those sicknesses or whatever, okay? And so that's how we accumulated a huge data set on the implications of unsound pesticide management in Sub-Saharan Africa. We used the cost of illness approach, okay? We looked at costs to the medical system, costs to workers lost time, costs to students not, miss, you know, not attending school, um, and so on and so forth. And then, then all of those accumulated values are placed on, or at least a significant percentage of them are placed on, what is it costing us not to have sound uh, uh, pesticide management in Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, a set of surrogate measures to place a value on something. That means that we could regulate it and, and, and eliminate, eliminate all those costs which now become benefits by regulating uh, pesticides better in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, now stated preference methods on the other hand, whereas, whereas there's observed methods that we just talked about where you're, you're observing behavior and you're, you're attributing uh, values to actual behaviors. Stated preference methods are used when those cases where you don't have actual behavior to look at and develop surrogates from, but you have a stated preference method, which methods which which basically refer to survey methods. Okay, they rely on information obtained by asking individuals to state their willingness to pay value for the increase in provision of a good or avoidance of a public bad. This is used in environment 
a regulation. For example, how, you know, you, you ask people, how much would you be willing to pay to not lose this, this nature preserve? All right. And, uh, and you know, you, you use this. Now, if you're not sophisticated, I mean, economists question the use of stated preference techniques to, uh, to determine willingness to pay. And they prefer revealed preference methods for obvious lesions. But when you can't use revealed preference methods, sophisticated stated preference, stated preference methods will have a greater error factor without question. But they will still provide you with a fairly strong indication of the benefits that people attribute to something that does not have a market price, okay? Now, I list the, the methods here, fairly straightforward, contingent valuation method. Uh, this type of survey asks how, many, how much money people will be willing to pay or willing to accept to maintain the existence of or be compensated for the loss of something they value, such as children's walking guards or a green space in their neighborhood or whatever the case may be. Um, okay, a contingent ranking method uh, response asks respondents to compare and rank alternate program outcomes. Okay, and that gets more that gets more precise because now you're asking people to make trade-offs, and when people have to make trade-offs, they're making conscious decisions about what they would what they would prefer to keep as opposed to lose. And when you do that with a human being, you're, you're, getting, you're getting people to think more deeply about the trade-offs that they have to make, all right? And that can help place a, a finer value on something because now it becomes comparative. Much like your paper in RGL 3300, you're starting to compare and contrast. And when you compare and contrast, you have a richer degree of information, all right? So respondents in this method are asked to, to rank alternatives in order of preference, all right? Conjoint analysis is another technique. This type of survey originated out of marketing primarily. It is typically used to determine what features a new product or service should have, but that service can be responsive to a regulation, for example. And, they, and they're asked to differentially price while faced with trade-offs between options, all right? So, uh, you know, people are you know, given a fixed budget, let's say. Let's say you have a million dollars, okay? Here are all the things on your list, but the things on your list that we're going to protect are actually, let's let's say, are going to be worth $2 million. So now you have a million dollars that you have to shed off this list. How would you shed that off this list? Okay, and then you begin to see very, not only what people prefer between functions or options or benefits, but you also see what value they place on those relative benefits that they do keep. So again, you have compare and contrast and you have ranking within the benefits that they're pr proposing to keep. And so this is used extensively in marketing for from automobiles to, to uh, site plans for new housing developments to focus groups for political parties, for uh, making large policy uh, programs and decisions by political parties. Uh, it's used extensively in, in numerous areas to place values on things that do not currently have a market price, okay? Now the final technique that we talk about is what we call the benefit transfer method, and that's essentially what you folks do in your term papers, which is that we rely on, on the information from existing studies that have applied these non-market methods of valuation in similar circumstances. In other words, we, we look at studies that have attributed values to non-market prices in other studies through sophisticated methods and but then we adjust those methods to the Canadian circumstance or the circumstance that we're working in all right remember I told you when we were talking about comparative analysis in RGL 3300 you have to look at not only you know what's going on with the method that somebody's using the uh, country's using to respond to a post-market surveillance gap but we have to also look at the applicability of that approach or method to the Canadian context. What benefit transfer methods do is essentially that. They take the information and the analysis from existing studies and they modify the results rationally and logically, making solid arguments why it needs to be modified to suit and be applicable to market, to, to, to as surrogate indicators in the Canadian context. Um, and so, for example, you couldn't use the same travel cost method in, in a country like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Switzerland or let's take a smaller country. Let's say in a country like Belgium 
compared to Canada, okay? Because the traveling distances are much hard, larger. Canadians are used to traveling much larger distances than Europeans are. Um, all of those factors would need to be, so if there was a travel cost method study done in Belgium, but it was directly applicable, same variables, same factors, it was a health clinic study, same everything else, but you wanted to take those values that the Belgian study did and you applied them to Canada, you would have to adjust them accordingly based on data you have about how much do Canadians normally travel. Is this unusual, not unusual? Are they revealing a preference by traveling further or is that just Canadians? Because we travel a lot, we have a huge country. All right, so, and these kinds of things would be factored. But this is the typical method used by most research papers, right? Um, in this case, we're talking about it from the context of surrogate uh, values from non-market prices, but it's the same method we apply in all of our secondary research, where we look at the research of an existing uh, 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 study and we say, oh, that's an interesting finding for the Canadian context, but how applicable is it to the Canadian circumstance? And that's essentially what the benefit transfer method does, but only in this case we're looking uh, for, for placing a value or a surrogate value on non-market prices. Whereas in a typical research paper you're not being that specific, but you're following essentially the same methodology, which is to say you're looking at a, a study on a very similar problem, say in another country, and you're saying how applicable is this to Canada, okay? And so, um, and that's what the benefit transfer method does. And because there are, there are lots of studies, for example, in environmental policy that have done around the world that have tried to place value on, on elephants and giraffes and other wildlife and plant species and trees and so on, um, they may be, they may be um, uh, strong indicators of what those surrogate values would be in Canada, but they might need to be in adjustment. Canada has lots of trees. But if you're doing a comparative study uh, with, with that, with say, um, the Mediterranean coast in France, you might, you, might, you might see that they might place much higher value on old growth trees there, as fewer of them, whereas in Canada we have lots of them, right? So there would need to be adjustments made to the assumptions, but nevertheless, you might be able to adjust the numbers from the French study to the Canadian study based on strong argumentation. You know, like what other studies would, would indicate that Canadians would place lesser value because of abundance than France, and then you adjust the numbers accordingly. Um, there are different techniques, but it gets very sophisticated. I've spent a lot of work, uh, I've done a lot of work in this area over the years, and it's a fascinating area, And uh, but it's, it's something you should be aware of for if you ever see this kind of work in the future in the context of regulation. Although we're not asking you to, to get to this point in this program, which would be not, not possible, obviously, uh, because this would typically be something you would do in a graduate program on um, empirical theory or uh, economics or um, political economy, okay? But anyway, you need to know about it because it, it is a very important question for regulators, right? I mean, you know, how do we avoid downward pressure on public goods when we're protecting the environment or other things that do not have a market price? How do we make sure that the cost benefit in our RIAs comes out fairly in terms of costs and benefits when a major category of benefits do not have a market price? What do we have to do to solve that problem? So we have a lot of environmental economists and other uh, uh, welfare economists uh, and political economists have invested heavily in this work because we're trying to avoid the problem of undervaluing benefits when we're regulating to protect the environment or regulating to protect public health that with indirect uh, causes of harm. For example, air pollution. WHO has, uh, has invested heavily in these techniques for, to come out with their studies on the, the, the costs of uh, air pollution to public health and these kinds of things. They've done work with this with the World Bank and others trying to place a value on environmental safeguards, um, all of these kinds of things. So this is an extensive area of work. It's just not publicly well known because it's extremely technical and complex area of work. Okay, but it's absolutely essential in the area of regulation to understand at least that it exists. Okay, on that score I'll let you, uh, let you go and uh, keep working on your RGL 3300 papers 
And then don't forget to shift to your RGL 3000 papers to get rid of our next call, or to, to deal with our next call in there where I, I will hope to field any questions you're having on setting up your cost benefit within your RIAS. Okay, take care for today. Bye-bye now.